Gracious and merciful God, we praise you on this day when we don't know if it's going to rain or sleet or snow, but we know that you're God of all creation. And today, may you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us as we praise you. We praise you for all that you are and all that you make it possible for us to be as well. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Would you join us for our gathering call today? I invite you to respond in the bold in English. Try your hand at Spanish, too, if you'd like. Okay. Isaac, will you lead us? Mm -hmm. By the grace of God has given, a foundation was laid for us by wise builders, and others more built upon that foundation. And now it is our time to build upon these foundations laid before and for us. Y ahora es nuestro momento de construir sobre estos cimientos establecidos antes y para nosotros. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Porque nadie puede poner otro fundamento que el que y está puesto, y cual el Jesucristo. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their, their work, work will, will be tested and shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. Su obra será aprobada y mostrada por lo que es porque el día la sacará a la luz. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, These there have come so that the proven geniusness of your faith. Estos han venido para que la probada autenticidad de vuestra fe 
of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Puede resultar en alabanza, gloria y honor cuando Jesucristo se ha revelado. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? Though you have not seen him, we, we love, love him. him. Lo amamos. And even though you do not see him now, we, we believe, believe in him. him. Nosotros creemos en él. So let, let us all be filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Y enémonos, pues, todos de un gozo infaible y glorioso. May God bless this reading and the hearing of the Holy Scriptures as we continue in worship today. Again, welcome to worship here at New Life Metropolitan Community Church on this almost mid-January Sunday morning. No matter who you are, how you self-identify, we're delighted to have you join us for worship today. Whether you're here on site or whether you're joining us on Facebook Live or whether you're watching us later in the week, you can do all of those or all three of those if you can't just get enough. Can I hear amen to that? Amen. Yeah, I knew you'd get there. Before you sit down, look over your mask and do your eyebrows up and down or do that queen wave so somebody around you knows who you are and just say good morning to someone around you. You may be seated for just a moment. And if you'll excuse me for one quick second. I knew if I did not do that, 
some of the queens among us would just go nuts throughout the service today, <laughs> namely me in that regard. A <laughs> couple of things to make you aware of as we go into this week. You should have gotten two pieces of paper when you came in. One's the order of worship with the songs. The other has the scripture page and the communion liturgy. And on the back is what's happening at New Life MCC. A couple of things to make us aware of. These were also uh, uploaded to Facebook. They're also in your email from last night as well. Uh, our board of directors had their first January meeting of the year, and I'm pleased to announce our new officers on the board. Of course, the pastor serves as moderator, Joy Gibbon continuing as vice moderator, Jennifer Hughes continuing as clerk, uh, Shelly Lee Knight as assistant clerk. Uh, we, as much as we are hating to see Chris leave, but it's his time to rotate off the board, we're delighted to have John Sieta serving as treasurer. Can I hear amen to that? And Rodney Souter, who just walked in the back to, as assistant treasurer. Thank you to John and Rodney. Two of the most labor-intensive positions on the board. So let's pray for our board of directors. We have an exciting year, hopefully, planned. We, yes, we've got challenges as we're going through the pandemic and the COVID, but so much things, so many things that God has continued to bless us with. Also this week on Tuesday at 6 p.m., our discovery and conversation group on racism continues. If you haven't joined in any of those, don't feel like that you can't. You can at any time. That's a Zoom link. We'll send that Zoom link out uh, in email as well. Two weeks from today will be our quarterly congregational forum. This is sort of a year-end forum because we'll hear finances from the 2021 and just take a look at where we are. Morocco, I saw you over here. You not This week, you're not promoting Meals to Go. That was last week. This week, you are coordinating our efforts around the fundraiser around the Super Bowl. So you want to tell us a little bit about what, needs, what we need to know. Grab Sandra's mic. So this is a, a, an opportunity for folks to help the church, but also possibly win something yourself. Yeah, good morning, church. Good morning. So um, we've done this for several years, so... Uh, most of you know that there's a Super Bowl coming up in a few weeks, and uh, every year we've been doing a, a raffle, a fundraiser for the church, and uh, the way it works is um, we have a grid here with 100, square, with 100 squares on it, uh, and for $2 you can buy a square, and uh, once we sell all of the squares... I'll be, I'll be Vanna. He'll be, he'll be Vanna. So once we sell all the squares in here for $2 a piece, we will then... Fill in, uh, randomly select 0 through 9 across the top for the AFC team and 0 through 9 on the, down, down the uh, side for the NFC teams. And then um, if you buy a square, at the end of the game, if the NFC team scores like 33 points and the AFC team scores 22 points, if you have the square that has the 3 and the 2 for the AFC and AFC, so the, the last digit in the score of the team matches your square numbers, then you win the prize. So it's a fit, what we call it's a 50-50 raffle. So there's $200 if we sell all the squares. $100 goes to the church, and $100 goes to the winner. Uh, we're going to have two, two, uh, uh, what do you, two, two grids. Thank you for that word. <laughs> two grids, so we have plenty of opportunity to buy. And we're also doing this, uh, you can buy them in person. Um, I'll be selling squares after church today. And we also, uh, because of COVID, we're going to be uh, a joyous setup where we can buy uh, on squares the online. Page, giving page, yes. So it's, a, it's the giving page and the events, and then you can register and pay. And if you buy your, your uh, squares online, I'll just go in and just fill in the blocks for how, as many uh, squares as you buy. So please, um, they're going, you can see from our square already, they're going, tickets are going fast, so uh, don't miss out, and uh, please buy your, buy your tickets. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I better stick with my day job, hadn't I? Maybe I find a set found a side gig. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Lots of things for us to keep in our prayers today as we go into and continue on in this year. Because as many challenges we face, we're still blessed in so many ways. And we're still called to be God's people, whether it's not just on Sunday morning here in worship, but wherever we are during the week.
because God's spirit, and I believe that the kingdom or the kingdom of God, the relationship with God and each other begins where the spirit of Christ is. And we believe that God's spirit lives in us, in me and in you. So wherever we are together, we know, and we, I say this a lot, God is where behind us, beside of us, but also ahead of us in this journey. Would you rise as you're able as we continue in worship today? going to invite uh, Ken and James and Scott to come and share with us excerpts from Martin Luther King's 1964 acceptance speech for the Nobel Peace Prize. Ken, speak into the mic. I accept this award today with abiding faith in America and an audacious faith in the future of mankind. I refuse to accept despair as the final response to the ambiguities of history. I refuse to accept the idea that the isness of man's present nature makes him morally incapable of reaching up for the eternal oughtness that forever confronts us. I refuse to accept the idea that man is mere fulsome and jetsome in the river of life, unable to influence the unfolding events which, sur which surrounds him. I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless night of racism and war that the bright daylight of peace and brotherhood can never become reality. I refuse to accept the cynical notion that nation after nation must spiral down a militaristic stair stairway into the hell of thermonuclear destruction. I believe the unarmed truth of unconditional love will have the final word in reality. This is why right this is why right, temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil, triumphant. I believe that even amid today's mortal bursts and whining bullets, there is still hope for a brighter tomorrow. I believe that wounded justice lying prostrate on the blood flowing streets of our nations can be lifted from the dust and shame to reign supreme among the children of men. I have the audacity to believe that people everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds and dignity, equality and freedom for their spirits. I believe that what self-centered men have torn down, men other-centered can build up. I still believe that one day mankind will bow before the altars of God and be crowned triumphant over war and bloodshed and nonviolent redemptive good will proclaim the rule of the land. And the lion and the lamb shall lie down together, and every man shall sit under his own vine and fig tree, and none shall be, shall be afraid. I still believe that we shall overcome. This faith can give us courage to face the uncertainties of the future. It will give our tired feet new strength as we continue our forward stride towards the city of freedom. When our days become dreary with low hovering clouds and our nights become darker than the thousand midnights, we will know that we are living in a creative turmoil of genuine civilization struggling to be born. we think about these words that were spoken in 1964, how applicable they still are today. We must be committed to, yes, overcoming the challenges that we face, even though we may face uncertainty here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, what the new administration is going to mean for our community. We don't know yet, but we will continue to overcome. Say it with me. We shall. We shall overcome, overcome. With, God's grace. with God's grace and the Holy Spirit leading us. We will be committed 
will be committed to justice, to, justice. to God's love, to God's and, love. love. and that love will win, and the love will win. Will win. Over, hate. over hate. We shall overcome. Let's sing together. Let's read from Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right hand or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared by my father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. 
Instead, whoever wants to become great amongst you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. the first prayer that you remember as a child was it now I lay me down to sleep maybe some of you still pray that as adults that's okay too or how about if food what is it God is good God is great for those of you who went to camp maybe you heard the Superman prayer thank you Lord for the food we eat <laughs> try that in a restaurant sometime and see what happens <laughs> I would say this, that it doesn't make any difference the words we use. It doesn't make any difference the format of the prayer. It's not about that. It's, and we say this almost every week. It's about relationship with God and with each other. And in our prayer times, we want to lift up a number of things. I think most of you are aware that Rhonda Thorne's mom passed uh, this week. So keep Rhonda and Christine and their family in our prayers. Uh, let's continue to keep Jane Robinson in our prayers. Uh, she is in rehab over in Hampton so and does, uh, is receiving visitors. Uh, Donnie was with us last week, Donnie Durst, um, and is now in a nursing convalescent center in Hampton as well. I understand he can have visitors from 8 until 8 p.m., so let's continue to keep Donnie in our prayers. Odessa Johnson is in the hospital undergoing tests. Let's remember Odessa. And after worship today, uh, if you want to send a video message, Jeff will be doing that uh, to some of our folks uh, in my office. And just a brief word of just saying hello, letting folks know you're thinking about them. I encourage you to stay a little bit afterwards if you can do that. Most of all, throughout this week, not only today, but let's remember each other. And let's remember others that we know are hurting. And we may say, oh, woe is me. I've got so much stress going on in my life. But you know what? A lot of other folks do too. And there's a lot of sickness, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of stress about jobs, about finances, about relationships. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how do we hold all of it in both hands? You know what? We don't have to because God is holding us as we hold each other. Would you pray with me? Gracious and merciful God, creator of us all, hold us in this moment. For those who are hurting and grieving, may your Holy Spirit of comfort and peace and strength Give us the wherewithal we need. Sometimes we can't see beyond the day because of our grief is so strong. May we lean on you. Hold us as we hold each other. For those of us who need healing, may it be physical, may it be emotional, intellectual, spiritual, healing, all of that wrapped into one. Make us whole, O oh God. In this moment, we lift up in our hearts all those who are struggling financially or have other stresses in their lives, whether it's at work, at school, or just in general. Because we claim this moment that you are our God. As we claim your presence, we also claim your promises. Promises for the hope that gets us through all the challenges that we may face in any given day, and even those unknown challenges that are there, that are yet to come. May we not be afraid, 
May we have the peace and the strength, the courage as we place our faith and trust in you anew this day. Give us that new life that leads us forward. And even when we step in it, give us the wherewithal to know how to step out of it. We just praise you, O God, for all that you are and all that you make it possible, not only for us to be individually, but for us to be together in this place that we call new life. And we ask that you would give us the insight, the ability to be in touch with the faith that you've already given us so that we can indeed be your people as you have called us to be now and in the days ahead. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let us be the generation. I like that song. If you look around this room, there are a number of generations in this room, starting with Tony Down. 
and some of us younger folks. <laughs> but it's not about that, is it? It's about the spirit with which we live in the moment together across the generations, too. My granny, and I miss her every single day. You, there's hardly a sermon ever that goes by that you don't hear a quote from my granny. I think I told you a story one time in one of my churches. We had a gentleman who said, if I hear one more granny story, I'm just going to get up and walk out. He never said that to me, but it got back to me. And then five years later, I was somewhere else, and he sent me an email, and he said, I sure could use a granny story about now. <laughs> Most precious thing in my moment. Mm. Granny used to say she used to go and make snow, snow cream. Have you ever made snow cream? But she didn't believe in making it in the first snow because she said it's got to clear out the atmosphere. Now, you know, there were, she didn't understand that the atmosphere is constantly moving, so it doesn't make any difference whether it's the first one or the second one or whatever. She also said that let it snow, let it snow so deep that you've got to climb a tree to get wood, she'd say. Some of y'all will get that on the way home. But you know what? Before worship today, it was starting. We didn't have any snow here, but it was starting to get deep, especially on this side over here. <laughs> I was so excited, but I stood back. I was not getting in this cat fight <laughs> between Sandra and Ken. But the love never diminished. But the love never diminished. That's right, Ken. Is that, do you agree with that, Sandra? I agree with that. She you. agrees with that. That's good. But it was a cat fight nonetheless. <laughs> And it was one to tell, a story to tell for the ages. We they, were, they were excited about who was going to sing what. And I thought, wow, if we could all be so excited about serving Jesus, you know, all the, when, when something's up, when the food's on the table, Tony's going to be the first one in the line. <laughs> but when it's time to pay the bill, where did everybody go? That's how we are sometimes, I think, about serving God. And, oh, it's, I need to go to the bathroom there. It's about to have the offertory. It's going to be... Well, we, don't worry, we don't pass the offering plates in this day of COVID. They're stationary. But may we be excited about what God is doing. May we be so excited not only about what God is doing, but what God has called us to do with God and with each other. So much so that we can, just like Ken and, and Sondra fighting over who is going to sing what, may we do that in terms of our service. And we say that we are called, and Paul's words to the church at Rome was, that we are to present ourselves as a living sacrifice as part of our reasonable act of, and some translators say service, some say worship. I don't think it's coincidence. I think that it's both because you can't separate our worship and our service, can you? I invite you to give today as God's Spirit leads you to give. Uh, you can get up at any time during the service and put something in the offering plate or go to our electronic kiosk in the back or on your cell phone. You can do it that way. When you get home, go to our website, newlifemcc.net. Click on the giving tab and you can continue to drop down and to give as God's Spirit leads you to give because God has called us to this place and we are blessed in many ways. Who would have imagined in the middle of a pandemic that we would have raised over $145,000 toward our capital campaign? And so we're moving ahead this year to hopefully be able to purchase this place. But this place is just the place. The as people of God must be committed to the ministries that we want to do from here. And, and yeah, we can't just get up and go to the bathroom when it's time for the offering. We've got to all pitch in. And remember, it wasn't those who were fighting over giving that, that, that Jesus called attention to. It was the widow woman who put in just a few cents. Yes. And Jesus yes. said, of all that was given today, she gave all that she had. May God bless us, O Lord, as we come. Bless our offerings, no matter how large or how small we may think they are. May you multiply the intent of our heart in a way that we can make a difference in someone else's life as so many have made a difference in ours. We know indeed, O Lord, that you have brought us together for this time and place and ministry. May we serve you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I invite you to give as God's Spirit leads you to give today. Everybody's got something to offer, young and old, the prince and the pauper. Everybody's got something to offer, in the name of the Lord. Everybody's got something to offer, young and old, the prince and the pauper. Everybody's got something to offer, in the name of the Lord. To the lost 
God, we do indeed offer our thanks today for the gift that you bestowed upon this church. God, please allow us to use these gifts to give you glory in all that we do. Amen. You may be seated. Lord, help us all. For those of you at home who may not have heard that, uh, there's something here. So Ken and Rich, who usually sit here, had to move to this side. It's still to be determined which is the good side or the bad side today. So if you'd like to get up and move to the good side, you may feel free to do that. <laughs> that said, what did you dream about last night? Now, don't share it. Just think about it. Did you dream last night? You did. Do you remember what you dreamed about last night? We don't always do that. Granny used to always say that you should take our dreams opposite. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. And there's so many different ways of dream interpretation and cultures and people have thought through the years. In the Bible, we know that those in those early ancient years, they, they had Joseph, for example. He was a great dreamer growing up. But his dreams got him in trouble when he shared his dreams that his brothers were all going to bow down to, to him and the way he interpreted that. And, of course, we know that Joseph was a little spoiled and he was his dad's favorite. And you remember that wonderful technicolor green coat that he had, dream coat. You see, it fits the theme just perfect, doesn't it? I didn't plan that. Later he grew up and he realized, I think, that he needed to be a little more mature in that. And he learned how to use the gifts that God gave him in interpreting dreams and yes, it got him out of trouble when he got in trouble sometimes, but it also helped him save not only the people of e Egypt, but the people that would become the people of Israel as well. Now, sometimes we think about dreaming, and some of us may daydream. Some of you may be starting to do that during the sermon right now. Well, I, we, we have a way. We've got a dream meter here, so I'm going to know later. I'll, we'll post it online who was daydreaming during the sermon. Bonnie, I see you going dozing off back there. We also, in our dreams, we may be thinking about what we would like. It may be not reality, and we may think what's coming to our minds. I know, you know this thing, and some of you may, may be, like me, a little bit challenged when it comes to all the technology, and I haven't put anything on TikTok. I'm on Facebook and trying to get to Instagram and Twitter once in a while. But there was a TikTok out there, and this kid must be from Duke. Duke, excuse me for mispronouncing it. Um, because he has a Duke t-shirt on 
And he said he was trying to explain to his father's high society, very rich girlfriend. And she said, what do you do for a living? And he said, I'm employed with uh, Dior Dache. And, and she said, I don't think I've heard that. And, and, she, and he said, well, it's an international food delivery service. And she said, are you talking about DoorDash? He said, well, that is one way you could pronounce it. <laughs> I like what somebody else said that, to be better than we are, we don't have to pretend to be something that we are not. So in our dreams, whether it's what we dream or the visions that we're looking for the future, maybe that should guide us in some ways. Now, if you think back to Shakespeare and the play The Tempest, and we've heard this said before, and but there's a misquote here. Say it if you know it. We are such stuff as dreams are made of is what we've heard all of our lives and if we believe google it's like five times almost out of whatever that it gets misquoted it says we are the dream we are such stuff as dreams are made on now is there a difference between dreams made on and the actual line goes this way we are such stuff as dreams are made on and our little life is rounded with sleep Someone went on to say, so there's one way to look at this. We live, then we die, or we're here, then we're gone without a trace. All puns intended, that can be a little fatalistic. And so I ask us today, as we think about where we are in our own spiritual journeys, are we dreaming the dream? Are we living the dream? Or are we waking up from the dream? Maybe some of you have heard of one of my favorite groups, the mamas and the papas. Since I'm now a grandpapa, just want to make sure you're pronouncing it correctly. It's the mamas and the papas. I bet some of you know this song. All the leaves are brown and the sky is gray. I've been for a walk, what? On a winter's day. I'd be safe and warm if I was in L.A., California dreaming on such a winter's day. But I bet you may not remember this verse. Some of you may because you're here today. Stopped into a church I passed along the way. Well, I got down on my knees and pretend to pray. You know, the preacher lights the coals. I'm not sure what that means. Let's be putting some fire under us. He knows I'm going to stay. California dreaming where? On a, say it with me. On a winter's day. Where are you dreaming? Are you dreaming the dream? Are you living the dream? Or are you waking up? from the dream and I want us to think about that in a number of ways when we were home over Christmas my cousin Kenneth asked me if I dream and if I dream a lot and he suffers from sleep apnea now when I answered yes and a lot my mom misheard him she thought he said do you drink and do you drink a lot and so I'm saying yes a lot and my mom's going really well he said dream and they do tell me that those of us who suffer perhaps from sleep apnea, we may not recall, it's not that you don't dream, but we may not recall those dreams as vividly because we're not spending as much time in that deep sleep level where we're allowed to dream. Now, there are two reasons today that I'm using this dream thing. One, it is MLK weekend, Martin Luther King weekend, and one of his most famous speeches was what? I have a dream. If you ask people across this land, what was his most famous? That's the one we almost always go to. The second reason, though, is that in the passage of Scripture that we have not read yet is one that's very familiar. It's probably the most famous miracle that Jesus performed. And I know some of you, and some of you are going to say, yeah, I can remember when Jesus turned water to wine. That was a good one. And some of you know why you think that, too. Frederick Beatner suggests that if we think of this account of the wedding in Cana of Galilee, like a dream. Now, don't hear me, mishear me here. I'm not saying or suggesting this didn't happen, but Beekner is saying, let's think about it like a dream, because when we think about how we dream, well, there's going to be mystery there. There's we're looking for some meaning for something that's underneath there. And when we wake up from that dream, what's the most powerful thing we remember from that dream? I've been preaching this sermon, I hate to admit it, Tony. For nigh on 40 years. The first time I heard it and remembered hearing it was in a Baptist church back home. And it was a hellfire and brimstone sermon. And the point of the sermon was good Baptists don't drink. 
I'm sort of ashamed of how what happened when I went to seminary and learned a little bit of Greek, enough to get myself in trouble, and was invited back to that church. It was my home church, and I did something I probably it felt so right at the time I wouldn't do again kind of thing. I preached that passage, and I refuted every single thing that the pastor said in his church with him on the front row. Ouch. Because my point was that if it wasn't real wine that Jesus made, what are we saying about the power of God? The power in our God and to, to help us through those challenging times, but also in those times of celebration and joy. This was a wedding after all. Now, I know for some of us who've been married for so long, well, may, well maybe that wedding ain't so, so exciting and joyful as it used to be. But it should be. I say at every wedding, this is a day that the Lord has made. Let us what? Rejoice and be glad in it. But in some ways, weddings are sort of compression moment. Reverend Elder Arlene Ackerman was a big fan of compression work, meaning that she did a lot of work on a weekend when she'd come to work to a church. Dreams are sort of like that too. Weddings are sort of like that too. It's not that it's your entire life, but a lot of those emotions get packed into that moment. There's laughter at weddings. There's tears of joy. And lots of times, there's sentimental tears. It's not those deep down things that we may have to do later. Frederick Buechner that I mentioned earlier said this, Beyond the mystery of what it means, talking about a dream and talking about this passage from the wedding in Cana of Galilee, detail by detail, level beneath level, maybe the most important part of a dream is the part that stays with you, and I said this a moment ago, when you wake up. Beekner says also, I think that what we carry from it is most powerfully and simply a feeling of joy. And he says, a wedding that almost flopped except for this strange, stern guest, talking about guess who, worked a miracle and it turned out to be the best wedding of all. Do you remember that story? It's on your scripture page where on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee we're told that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there, and Jesus and his disciples were invited too. And Mary comes to him, and she says they're out of wine. Now, we'll get to that part in a moment, but if we think about where was this Cana of Galilee? Some folks say it was four miles. Some people say it was nine miles from Nazareth, so it was within walking distance, I guess, for some of us that are inclined to drive everywhere. Me. But who was with Jesus? Well, earlier on, we're not sure it was all the disciples, but if we just take John's gospel, for example, we know there was an unnamed disciple. There was Simon Peter, there was Andrew, there was Philip, and Nathaniel. Guess where Nathaniel was from? Cana. Was this somebody that they knew? Was it, was they, were they invited by Nathaniel? Or was it somebody that Mary knew or perhaps they were even related to? You know, back home in the mountains, we are definitely, aren't we, James? We're related to everybody up there. You laugh, but your mama's married to your daddy and your aunt and your uncle and your uncle to your uncle, other uncle, and all this sort of stuff. And it gets convoluted sometimes. But in these small communities... No doubt, if they weren't related to each other, they knew each other. And some of, how many of you grew up in a small town? Not only do you know everybody, you're probably related to somebody, but even if you don't know them or aren't related, you know everything that goes on. Especially now with Facebook, right? And Twitter and all that good stuff. So that's what we know about this place. And the Greek even implies that maybe Mary was there before Jesus, and you might make an assumption, well, maybe she did have some connection. Maybe she had some responsibility there. And, you know, a typical Jewish wedding was not just come to the church and look all pretty and, you know, do you, do you, I do, I do, and you're off on the honeymoon kind of thing. This was a whole usually week, at least week long of festivities and activities and people would come and sometimes because there'd be so many people coming, people would be expected to bring food and even some wine to help out with everything. And it was a legal contract. So there were social implications, there were embarrassing kind of implications, but there were also perhaps some legal ramifications for running out of wine. One theologian suggests that there's also an underlying issue of justice. And you're thinking, really? How could just running out of wine at a wedding, but remember this is an arid land, 
Some of you are old enough, not me, but some of you are old enough to remember Woodstock. I'm not even sure I'm going to ask if any of you were at Woodstock. But can you imagine, Jim, were you at Woodstock? Oh, my goodness, Jim, you'll have to tell us some stories. I heard they ran out of everything at Woodstock. Yeah, I must have been about five at the time. But in a community where not everybody has equal access to things, there could have been a justice issue. This person said that running out of wine was a real crisis for gathering in the ancient world. The, li- the, dra- the land is dry, the climate arid, and there's not enough clean water. So people relied on the wine to remain hydrated. I know you're going to quote that one and misquote that one for a long, long time. But put it this way, that in the community, families didn't have the kind of resources perhaps to pay for food of a large number of people over a number of days. And it would have been shameful, and there could have been, yes, some legal implications How does this relate to Dr. Martin Luther King on this weekend, you might ask, as we ask the question again, what were those three questions? Are you dreaming the dream? Are you living the dream? And are are you waking up from the dream? Someone wrote this, that Dr. King laid bare the shame of our country, a land of plenty and abundance, allowing its citizens to go hungry. He believed ending hunger and poverty was essential to achieving freedom and equality for all people. He said, let us march on poverty until no American parent has to skip a meal so that their children may eat. Like the lack of wine at the wedding of Cana, he placed the responsibility on the community. So we get back to Mary and to Jesus. So Mary comes up to Jesus and says what? They don't have any wine. And what does Jesus say to Mary? Don't you just love this part? If I'd have said this to my mama, ooh, I know what she would have done. Woman, I'd have, uh, I might, yeah. Woman, what is it to me and what is it to you? Now, everybody tries to do whatever with this. And, and, and in all honesty, it probably wasn't as harsh and rude as what we take it to mean. It very well could have been a a term of respect because from the cross we hear Jesus refer to to Mary again, woman behold your son, son behold your mother, as he passes off responsibility for care for his mom to John or the other disciples that were there. So I don't get too bent out of shape about that part, but I love Mary's response to Jesus when he says, woman, what is it to me and to you? She looks at the servants and what does she say? Do whatever he asked you to do. She has such faith in her son, knowing that it may take a little motherly prodding. Who of us have not had a little motherly prodding or needed some motherly prodding along the way? It may also say a lot to us in this day that there are times in our journeys, there are times in we're called in our spiritual journey or our work at church or wherever, we may have to step up to the plate and do some things that we may not feel like it's our time to do. We may have to step up to the plate and do some things that we don't want to do. How many times have we been there? But may the Spirit guide us and lead us in that weekend. My goodness, my goodness. As we think about this and we think about the symbolism that's there. And so what Jesus said to the servants was, and we're, we're told there were six stone water pots that were sitting there. And they weren't for just water. They were for the ritual washing of the day and depending on who you ask and what you what you read depending on which type of ritual washing it could be a a little bit of water or a lot of water or even water how many of you like eggs and go to the grocery store Aldi's has the best price I think on eggs these days but you you get a you got an egg about this size that the volume of a great a large chicken egg sometimes was always required well you can't even diddle dabble do you that won't do it you don't even have you need more hand sanitizer than that to clean things don't we You see, it was about the symbolism because from the time that the Ten Commandments were given to the time of Jesus, it was over 600 and some rules and regulations that the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and all those folks had put this wall around the law in the auspices of protecting the law. But they were keeping people from getting at the real meaning. And so perhaps there was meaning in that six water pots with seven being the number of perfection. But remember, humankind was created on what? 
according to the creation story, the sixth day. So perhaps there's all kinds of symbolism there. It was on the third day that this wedding took place. And, of course, we're thinking about the third day after the crucifixion. Jesus did what? Jesus overcame the power of death and sin and all of that for us today. So there is great symbolism. And you're all saying, yeah, but let's get to the good part. Now, I am really taking a risk here because someone who is such a wine connoisseur as Dr. Sandra Winstead is, my goodness, I know you're going to tell me that I'm using the wrong kind of wine glass over here. So there were six stone water pots. I don't have one large. This is about a gallon. Each of those water pots were big enough to hold 20 to 30 gallons. This is a gallon. Now, I don't know if this is water or might be a little moonshine from back home. I don't know. Just to prove it, this will hold a gallon. So if you think about that, 30 gallons times six is how much? 180. Do you have any idea how many, what 180 gallons of, of wine looks like? Sam and Jeff, can we put on the screen what that much wine can look like? That's two big pallets of wine there. That's about what we'd be talking about. There's one more picture, I think, too. If you go to Total Wine, you'll see it stacked up. All those one, two, three, four. That, that's a lot of wine. Now, I've got my Marlene glass here. But you can't see through the Marlene glass. And it's a little bit larger than the other glass. But an average glass of wine, they say, what is about? What is it, Sandra? How many ounces? Five ounces. And a bottle of wine is about 750 milliliters, right? They tell me that if you take two Coke cans, that'll, oh, that's 24 ounces. It's about 20, somewhere between 24 and 25 ounces in a, a wine bottle. Now, for some of you that really need a little bit more, you could get the double that, the magnum size over here. <laughs> it's always good to have magnums around. So... What was that? Yeah. So you, uh, 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 we'll come back to that in a minute, Christine. This was a lot of wine, folks. This was 900 bottles. If you take the larger number of what, between 20 and 30, this was probably 900 bottles of wine. A good party. And, you know, so one theologian said, you know, that's the point. Jesus didn't just do it to show his glory. Jesus did this in the middle of the relationships that were there for people who were celebrating. Jesus was celebrating with them. And we expect people to always see Jesus at a funeral. Well, I don't know many funerals that Jesus went to that he didn't turn into a celebration. He does the same thing for you. And I, I love, I've been, as I said, I've been talking about this, this passage of Scripture for about 40-some years. And I, Granny used to have a great big churn jar, but all I've got is this little gallon thing here. Hmm. You'll be wondering all day whether that's water or moonshine, one or the other. Now, let's go back for one quick thing. Who knew what was going on? The steward of the banquet came and they drew some out. And he said, oh, my goodness, this is great. But the scripture tells us he didn't know what was going on. Only the servants knew. Now, you know, you, know, you all kid me about saying around the manger that the, the cows and the sheep were, got involved in that. And the, they say, Messiah. And, and they say, baby Jesus, baby Jesus. Tracy showed me one more. That all these people were from Bethlehem. Bethlehem. And takes us back to that moment when Jesus was born. And who were the first to hear it? The shepherds, the lowly shepherds and the servants were the one to hear. And here in this moment, Jesus is doing what we remember as one of the most powerful miracles of his times. And who knows? Only the servants. One theologian said this, that it is the poor who are privy to the angel revelations. Those at the bottom really know what's going on, for they bear the consequences of communal justice, injustice. When there's enough, they know it. They get what they need to eat. And when there's scarcity, they are the ones who starve. 
someone also pointed out that the civil rights movement really was birthed with the Montgomery bus boycott. And who were the workers and the average workers and people who were using mass transit, the bus system in, the, in that day? And yet it was their efforts that led to legislation that would eventually be passed that would outlaw segregation. So let us, you and I, if we hear nothing else, as we think about are we dreaming the dream? Are we living the dream? Are we waking up from the dream? Because you and I need to wake up from whatever dream we thought we were living in because there is still injustice in this land. And we don't know. There's a lot of unknowns in this state of this Commonwealth of Virginia. There's a lot of unknowns of what's going to happen in the United States in the next. You and I need to wake up from that and to be able to see reality as we can. And let's not forget the, the model that, and the example that Jesus said. It wasn't just about showing his glory. It says that his disciples understood and saw his glory and they believed him but one theologian said it this way, and I love this, that here we see a glimpse of who Jesus really was. We see a glimpse of Jesus' heart, not his power in making the wine. Everybody can go to the wine store, go, to, go out somewhere down the road and buy a gallon of moonshine. If you're back home, you can. But not everybody has the heart of Jesus. May you and I find it in our lives in this journey as we think about what? Dreaming the dream? living the dream, and waking up from the dream. The heart of Jesus will guide us in so, so many ways. You know, it's about extravagant abundance. My goodness, there was enough there. Jesus took what was for the ritual washing of the Jews, maybe only enough water to look like that, and said, that's not what matters. What matters is being able to share it with the whole community. And that's how God's grace is. It finds us in the midst. It's extravagant abundance. You don't have to earn it. It's given to each of us. The question is, will we partner with God not only to receive it, but also to share it? Now, maybe some of you think I'm a North Carolina mountain hick, and sometimes I may be. And my accent sort of gives me away once in a while, right, Tony and James? Well, once in a while, I'll read a little bit. You ever heard of Dostoevsky? Thank you for pronouncing it correctly. That was the Yankee versus the Mountain way of saying it. <laughs> There's a character in one of those books that he wrote, Alexei, who goes in, and in the Rus Russian Orthodox Church, he goes in, and I think it's his brother who has died and passed away, and the priest is there, and guess what passage? Because part of their tradition is to continue reading the Gospels and as they're preparing to grieve, and the, the funeral arrangements are there. So he goes in, and the priest is reading from John, the wedding of Cana of Galilee. And he sort of falls asleep like some of you have been doing, although you're wondering if I'm going to pass the wine here in a few moments. And when he wakes up, he's remembered part text that he's hearing and part of what he's dreamed. And then the dream was about realizing how blessed he was so much so touched that he leaves the casket of his brother and goes out and kisses the earth and wants to just forgive everything. May the grace of God find us as we read these passages written so long ago that that kind of extravagant abundance of God will take hold of you and me and do the same thing for us. Some years back I gave folks here and at other churches I've done this too because somebody shared the story, you've heard this story before, is that in a lot of times when you go to a church meeting and you're getting ready to, to, to eat, after Tony's trying to be first in the line, they'll tell you, keep your fork, why? Because the best is yet to come. I've given people at times a fork and said, you know, the best is yet to come. I didn't bring you a cup of wine today. Say, keep drinking because it never runs dry. God's love is never going to leave you. It's that thirst quenching kind of thing. But a story from that that I'll never forget, some years, or maybe it was not even a year, maybe it was a month after giving folks in a congregation those purple forks at Easter, I was sitting in a hospital emergency room waiting room with a family whose daughter was about to pass. And the dad comes in, and he reaches in his pocket, and he pulls out that fork. And he looks at me, and he said, I'm holding on my fork today. 
because I don't know what else to hold on to. The best is yet to come. I don't know what challenges that you're facing right now. I don't know what challenges we're going to face tomorrow. But we are created by and we are partnering with the God who does, does hold tomorrow. And yes, that is a cliche, but it's real too. May we not only dream the dream, live the dream, but wake up from our dreams to not only see reality, but to be in this moment and to celebrate the hope that God gives us to meet whatever comes at us. Can I hear an amen? amen? The Lord is with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks and praise. It is right indeed, O Lord, to give you thanks and praise. And so we lift our voices with all the saints and angels and proclaim your glory in unending praise as we praise together, saying... Most gracious and merciful God, creator of us all, savior of us all, a Holy Spirit that sustains us and is present not only with us, but ahead of us in this journey. As that Holy Spirit descends on us today, may we receive your power, your hope, your peace, your joy, all that we need in this moment to be in touch with the faith that you've already given to us. And may we grow in that. As you meet us, may we meet you. And as you hold us, may we hold you and each other. Gracious God, pour out your spirit upon these gifts on this table, those gifts we hold in our hand, and wherever folks may be today, at home or in the car or wherever or later in the week, we ask for your blessings today as we come to this table of grace, this table of thanksgiving, this table of community. Draw us closer to you and closer to each other. And all God's people said, Amen. Jesus took the bread from the Passover table and blessed it and broke it. You know, I like the translation that this is my body open to you. As often as you receive it, you receive me. In the same way, he took the cup and poured it and blessed it and said, this is the new covenant. It is for the forgiveness of sins. It's mercy, it's grace, it's forgiveness, it's compassion, all rolled into one. I like to paraphrase it this way. You can't do anything that's going to cause God to love you less. We're called upon to receive it. Sometimes we're called upon to give that forgiveness and love to each other as well. Would you think about where you are in your journey? Whisper to yourself, it is for me. Now say it just a, bit, a little bit louder that you don't mind somebody else to hear, it is for me. Now say it a little bit louder so that the people in the grocery store or across the street can hear you and you're not ashamed to say it, it's for me. And now look to one or two people sitting around you or across the room. And don't, not everybody at one time, just one or two or three and say, it is for you too. This is the one time I'm giving you permission to point your finger at somebody. And I ask you to do that one or two or three at a time rather than generic all because sometimes we get so caught up in that generic, we overlook the people who are right in front of us that need to have a personal touch. Jesus understood the personal touch at this celebration of the wedding in Cana of Galilee. And even though it seems like he was not going to listen to his mother Mary, he did. And it wasn't just for that because he knew how important it was to be in relationship with those folks that are there. Today as we celebrate that it is for y'all and Ewans and all of that. Today we also proclaim the great miracle and mystery of our faith. My brothers and sisters, children of God, all of us, as we receive today, may indeed you find us. No matter where we are in our journey, whether we're just beginning to understand what it means to be a follower of you, or whether it means that as we come to this place, we are challenged to grow more than we have, and maybe we've just been sort of comfortable where we are. But as you lead us this day, O oh God, meet us, lead us, transform us. And all God's people said, Amen. It makes no difference whether you're a member of this church or of any other. It's not about that. It's about celebrating God's love for you right where you are. So if you're at home today or if you're here, if you're at home, go get a cup of juice, a cup of water, doesn't matter what, or a piece of bread, a piece of candy, doesn't make any difference either. 
If you're here on site, if you didn't get one of the individual communion packages, you can get one from the table, raise your hand, someone will bring it with you. The choir's going to sing, and after the choir sings, we'll share together the body of Christ. We share together the body of Christ. The cup of salvation. I invite you to rise as you're able and let us sing the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray. Our Creator. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, 
our closing song today. No matter where you are in your journey today, whether you are dreaming the dream, living the dream, or waking up from a dream, and sometimes we wake up and, my goodness, we are hit in the face trying to figure out when things go wrong, because inevitably, in the middle of whatever else is going on that's happy, something sometimes can go wrong, can it not? And we experience that. And sometimes us preacher types get in the middle of all of that trying to figure out what this means or that, that we can't even see the joy. As I said, for 40 years I've been preaching this sermon. I never thought to preach it as a happy wedding sermon. My goodness. May we. It is. And Jesus was celebrating with them. So in the middle of whatever we wake up into, whether it's a dream or a nightmare, may we remember that it is the spirit of the living Christ that helps us to live into the hope and the celebration of joy that's there. May we have just a closer walk with Thee. Amen. Well, hold on, let's start that one again. <laughs> See, so right in the middle of everything, something happens, doesn't it? The vowel sticks. Thank you. 
And if Jesus hear my plea, oh, daily walking close to thee, let it be.